Good afternoon, folks. This morning's top science news is worth springboarding into catastrophism evidence, especially for all the new viewers. A wonderful confirmation of the grand cohesive magnetic system of our galaxy, the Milky Way, which you can see here in NASA's animation. But more important than that confirmation, the rotation of the fields, shown in their key graphic by the red arrows, where the fields spin oppositely in the north versus the south. This was a super important discovery highlighted in the paper because it is one of the key aspects of the central plane region where those opposite flows meet, causing a fluid dynamic-like ripple in concert with the plasma physics Parker instability to make the galactic current sheet. This sheet hits our solar system every 12,000 years. It's hitting again right now, and it is the cause of the great disaster cycle, the cause of what will bring about catastrophe and the next age of Earth in the next two decades. In honor of that, here is all the evidence of the disaster with an ode to Douglas Vogt, who passed late last year. This is required viewing at the channel and will answer almost every question you have about the disaster, the magnetic pole shift, solar micronova, and much more. All the evidence. Enjoy. Last night, we shared with you the sad news of the passing of Doug Vogt from the Diehold Foundation. Doug worked on Earth's disaster cycles, the magnetic pole shift, and the solar nova for a few decades, but truly burst onto the scene and into the public eye at the exact right moment. At the end of 2018, we were reigniting the global interest in catastrophism science with the help of several others, but we were lacking the final pieces of the puzzle until Doug made one little comment on one of my videos. It caught my attention. I went to his channel, and the rest was history. And the future. As we mentioned yesterday, his most critical contribution was on the Nova level isotopes discovered on Earth and on the Moon, and their concentration in the disaster sediments from 12,000 years ago. Below the video here, you will find a link to Doug's channel, the Diehold Foundation, and the video you want to find is Series 4, Part 2, Causes of the Ice Ages and Scientific Proof Are Sun Novas. In that video, he goes over his decades of work reviewing the isotope findings, in fission tracks, glass beads, fossils, and more. There is no question that these are made by stellar nova events. Even a mega meteorite that would sterilize the entire Earth could not produce enough energy to make these isotopes, and obviously no such impactor happened 12,000 years ago. Even the meteor they say killed the dinosaurs millions of years ago wasn't strong enough to make them. It didn't produce Nova-level isotopes, and, obviously, again, nothing like that happened 12,000 years ago. As if it wasn't important enough that we find these Nova isotopes in the disaster layers at the correct time in history, we combined this evidence with the other astrophysical studies to end all doubt that it was the Sun providing these Nova events. Let's watch our old video on the topic, which happens to be one of the times we did battle with Harvard, this time armed with the background information from Mr. Vote. Let's jump in our time machine and go back to one of the two great battles we've had with Harvard Center of Astrophysics. With this morning's story about Nova isotopes on Earth, it is worth revisiting the real science on this topic, and I will try to do it in a way that is very simple to understand. Let's watch the rundown video from 2020, and I will be inserting breaks for more explanation. Here's the backstory. Dust delivered isotopes from supernova are discovered on Earth. Scientists know that it must have been a relatively nearby nova after the formation of our solar system. They know this because the isotopes don't last that long. A long ago nova likely seeded the sun and all the nearby stars, but that was too long ago for these isotopes. And if it was from far away, it would take too long for the dust to arrive at Earth. There has been a smoking gun piece of evidence to suggest that indeed a recurrent micronova from our sun is to blame, and now that concept comes under fire from a place that commands the ears and respect of the established academic world. Dr. Jonathan David Slavin from the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics is publishing on the survivability of that dust and presence in the heliosphere, thereby facilitating the delivery to Earth. The paper suggests that a solid enough fraction of the dust from nearby Nova could have indeed been the Earth's source of those isotopes. This is actually the formalization of a conference submission made earlier in the year, 
wrapping up his findings now, and indeed he is considered a top expert on dust destruction by Nova shocks. Now, in this work, the conclusion to the direct question of whether that Nova dust could be transported to the Earth from somewhere other than the Sun is a yes. Let's look at the work and it will quickly become clear where the differences lie. So this began after we were discussing the evidence for solar micronova in December of 2018. And while it doesn't address the multiple lines of evidence, the Harvard guy here and his team definitely suggest that the dust can absolutely arrive here from nova events on other stars, even despite the rapid decay rates of some of them and the problems that poses. So why would you not just believe the Harvard guy, right? Let's go back to the video. First, they use the presumption that the grains exist within a pre-existing nova cavity, and indeed, that's not bad. That would be the local void or local bubble of that long-ago supernova that seeded our local stellar neighborhood today. They do say it is speculation and that those calculations have not been carried out, and we will come back to that. The core issue in this analysis is the presumption that magnetic fields are not important amidst the gas through which the dust is moving, and so... Slavin decides not to model them. Now that should be a giant red flag. And indeed, in critiquing another work in the field, in this same paper, Slavin calls out the red flag of their ignoring magnetic fields in their model. But didn't you just... never mind. Twin red rectangles blowing in the breeze there. That's right. In this paper, they not only scoff at a different team for ignoring magnetic fields, but they ignore them in their own analysis. That is both goofy and hypocritical, and it's scientifically shameful in how they ignored such a fundamental feature, the magnetic fields. Let's go back to the video. But back to his speculation about the survival of the dust within the local bubble, which he says has not been properly calculated. Well, it has, just not in the parameter space of his model. It has, on the other hand, been modeled while not ignoring the magnetic fields. This team isn't exactly second rate. They hold positions at the Air Force Science Division, CERN, King's College London, and the University of Illinois. If you recall, publishing an arguably the most important astrophysics journal on the planet, showing that the magnetic fields are important in the restriction of those dust grains to the Nova Remnant, and not their blasting out into space to seed the Earth, for example, which of course, leaves only one possible source for those isotopes on Earth. So yes, not only does the decay rate of some of the isotopes make other stars problematic culprits for the nova isotope presence on Earth, but the nova dust carrying those isotopes should be trapped inside of the remnant. Unless, of course, you wish to intentionally omit critical aspects of the analysis. Let's go back to the video. Lastly, this new work by Slavin, while it will criticize a paper for ignoring what it ignores itself, it does not address or even cite the dusty magnetic pinball paper. Seems like that one should be addressed or at least mentioned. This may not matter much to you, but for serious scientists, it is important to address and counter studies that oppose your own. Kind of like I'm doing here with the Harvard guy who says we are wrong. His lack of doing so is very telling, especially given how many papers he did cite in composing his work. It's a grand failure. As many of you know, there are other scientists at Harvard who are on our side, and they've told me how my video got under Slavin's skin, and that I was referred to as an unrespectable pseudoscientist conspiracy theorist. My, my. Don't flatter, Dr. Slavin. Instead, why don't you come take one more whack at this? See if you can do better on the second try. And second try he did, except once again, intentionally ignoring the magnetic fields. It's hard to really come to terms with exactly what happened here in this little battle between us and Harvard, but one thing I can say for sure is whether you're looking at plasma cosmology versus dark matter, mainstream climate science versus solar forcing of the terrestrial atmosphere, or you're right here looking at nova astronomy and whether or not to include the magnetic fields. In every case, that which they choose to ignore is the only way they come to the conclusions that are force-fed to us through the media. In reality, we should know better. And it would actually be funny if it wasn't so scientifically sad and coming out of Harvard. Right now, 
there are several affirmative proponents of the solar micronova, including some at major institutions who wish to remain in the shadows. The list of those who are now at least considering it is actually too long to break out here. Folks, while Doug Vogt and I have a lot of differences in our physical description of the solar nova, the cause, the power, the impact to Earth, I will always credit his work in bringing to light all the isotopes that exist here on Earth and how many can only come from nova events. It was the catalyst that finally convinced me the sun does nova. While some isotopes like aluminum do last long enough to be explained in Slavin's way, several others do not, including some of the really rare ones. Those must be from the sun. Other ones like iron, which do survive for millions of years, certainly long enough to get here, those are the most susceptible to magnetic fields. We're talking about iron, and those would have certainly been trapped with the other dusty pinballs within the remnant. Alas, our second battle with Harvard went the same as the first one did. The nova isotopes on Earth are the most vital piece of the solar micronova puzzle, and no, you cannot just ignore magnetic fields. So to review, there are nova isotopes in the exact places in the ground we'd expect to find them if the solar nova was part of the 12,000 year disaster cycle. Nova magnetic fields prevent the dust from arriving here from other stellar nova events, not to mention they would have decayed over time if it was a distant event in time. Only the sun could have delivered those isotopes and we find them where we'd expect them to be. Now, let's see another video of ours which shows why the solar micronova is not only required to explain the isotope evidence we have in the disaster cycle, but it is actually demanded by solar, astrophysical, and galactic science. Let's complete the scientific proof. Enjoy. The solar micronova is going to happen in the coming years, and it will be the most devastating thing that's happened to this planet in about 12,000 years. But we'll get to that. Nova astronomy. Well, that's been quite the disaster over just the last several years. If you graduated after having studied astronomy a decade ago and you have not kept up, you literally know nothing about nova events, but you're about to. And what follows is the demonstration that this changing paradigm will eventually result in the recognition that the sun has a solar micronova recurring event, even if it takes the black sun and explosion itself to realize it. Most nova are not supernova, where the star is destroyed, but they are recurring events. They get names like classical nova, dwarf nova, or rapidly recurrent nova, but all are actually recurring. The long-standing theory of how they occur, by accretion from a binary star, is still a valid way to make a nova, but it's no longer the lone mechanism, and this is how we open this door. Astronomers have discovered several nova events from single star systems with no degenerate binary, and that was before the poor little star that wandered into a molecular cloud and exploded like the subsequent dark nova that were discovered as well. Its trigger mechanism was the interaction with the material around it. All you need is to dump that material onto the star, whether that's from a binary or otherwise. They are having trouble classifying many of these events with some nova having to switch categories. Others taking odd names. The nova-like events are even more numerous than the official nova events, which means there's still a long road of the unknown to go for them to understand them. There are even more stars that blink. They darken, and then they re-brighten, including Betelgeuse in recent years. These don't have a bright luminosity aspect to them, a no-brightness nova event, just the dust shell ejection. It's a kind of micronova. The nova aspect of a pulsar is so tiny, it wouldn't even reach Mercury if something like that happened in our solar system. And after a century with just a handful of types of nova events, the list has begun to grow. New types of nova that challenge models and theory. Even new types of supernova events are being seen. And those on stars previously never seen before. And as if the no brightness nova wasn't weird enough, how about the no ejection nova? The no nova nova? Didn't learn about that in class, did you? From tiny white dwarfs to massive hypergiant stars, 
there are no star classes that cannot fall prey to the Nova symptoms. And yes, it is official that many of those Nova events are from single stars, not from binaries. This essentially nullifies the majority of the last century of Nova science that you find in textbooks. Now, while astronomers continue to be surprised by Nova events seemingly every month, I'm not even surprised anymore to read headlines like this. Perhaps they should begin to expect the unexpected. Especially since we now see Nova events without accretion, without material dumped onto them, and simply from a powerful magnetic kick to the star, as was the case here. So, there are two ways to get a Nova, a magnetic kick and material being dumped onto the star, whether from a binary or otherwise. How small can a Nova actually be? They have now found them tinier than super flares. In fact, as small as solar flares from the sun that we seem to get every 11 years or so. The lines are as muddy as they can be, and now we know from their own mouths that failure is at hand. This is one of the best Nova astronomers ever. He is plainly stating that the models and theory have failed, and unknown physics are at work. Now, with that, with Nova astronomy basically in shambles, let's get to the fun part. When they discovered a mini nova, yet another new one, I knew it was only a matter of time before they found micronova. And a few months later, after observers have been called crazy for years for saying these were real, they have finally admitted micronova exist. They still guess it's a binary and accretion scenario, but once more, they have no proof of that. It's just a guess. So let's come to galactic astrophysics for the journey to discovering that the sun can do it too. It has before, and it's about to do it again in the coming years. That story begins with a galactic magnetic field and electric field within the central plane. We call it the galactic current sheet. It's been seen in our Milky Way. It's been seen in other galaxies. It's been seen at the sun and other stars, and it's been seen in the lab. Let's take a moment to learn about this current sheet with our previous examination. Let's see some of this evidence, starting in the realm of simulations of the fields, which when placing flows opposite and parallel, they want to form the ballerina skirt waviness that appears near the midplane in the newest galactic field simulation, properly perpendicular to the fields breaking up and down from the wave crests, lets you know they're solid in their theory. And of course, the newest electric field simulation of those parallel oppositely flowing fields produces those endless ripplings. In the realm of observations, these would include the gamma signatures where the current sheet crosses the higher plasma and dust density midplane, the galactic equator, or how they've known this cloud of dust and plasma is heading right at us for decades and they just say it's a remnant of a past supernova. I love coincidences. Anyway, add on to the previous knowledge of the wave amplitude, we now also know the wavelength tens of light years, putting us about 200 or so ripples out from the galactic center in terms of the electric field. It's another gem from the recent Voyager studies on the magnetic pressure fronts it's encountering. Also key is how it's driven by the rotation. In the lab, in the solar system, everywhere, if the central node wasn't spinning, the field would be flat. But you put a spin to her and she happily abides by the physics of plasmas under the influence of that central node. This is the why to the ubiquitous observations matching theory, matching math, and simulations and more observations, the rotation of the system. The want for clarity is understandable. I checked. The news concerning the revolution in galactic magnetic field theory and the existence of the galactic current sheet has been shared here in 19 different morning news shows over the last 22 months with two more special videos. Now that's a lot to remember and a lot more if you have to go find them. Just a few years ago, even though astronomers knew galaxies were threaded with magnetic fields, they believed them to be an incoherent mishmash of the fields fueled by supernova, randomly scattered about. But all that began to change as infrared and radio missions began returning better data on the galactic field, the central torus, and the cosmic jet. While the national labs were proving that cosmic jets could be created by the interaction of magnetic fields and electric currents, astronomers were seeing the large-scale structure of the galactic magnetic fields. They have studied from above and found the curved fields, just like in our sun's current sheet. They have mapped our own and others from an edge-on perspective, finding both the toroidal field shape and the central plane. They have found that magnetic reversals occur cyclically in the stream they see in the plane 
indicating a sinusoidal pattern of magnetic field orientation. They've dug deeper, using polarized light to reveal what proper motion sometimes cannot. And since the door to this new galactic magnetic field paradigm cracked open, a flood has begun. And no part of that flood has been more important than the discovery and confirmation over and over that the magnetic fields are streaming outward inside of the central current sheet plane, and these string-like features indeed go out throughout the mid-plane of the galaxy, where over 90% of the stars are actually found. There in the plane, the field structure becomes more complex, with crisscrossing returns in the data indicative of those magnetic field sectors throughout the plane. Now up close, we see the fine local detail of the interstellar fields, but perhaps this is actually too close for the moment. Indeed, they are modeling the galaxy as a scaled-up version of the solar system, electromagnetically. Powerful central engine with an ion wind, poloidal magnetic field structure with a central current sheet containing the magnetic fields. As you get further out, it ripples more and more, and the closer waves also have higher amplitude. This is all due to the bunching up as you move out of a much broader undulation close into the system that goes for both the solar system and apparently the galaxy, where the wave amplitude follows that pattern where a nearly 3x increase in that amplitude comes as you compare the interior to the exterior portions of the galactic midplane, where the galactic sheet can be found. Recently, they even used gamma returns to catch nodes where the rippling sheet crosses the central plane of material and causes more interactions. As you might easily recognize, if you can count, this is not spiral arm over densities. We've never seen a galaxy with arms concentrically twisted that many times, especially on one half of the galaxy. Galactic nucleus is off the page to the right. Those nodes are indeed the sheet. Now coming down to the level of the sun. Astronomers' initial guesses were way off years ago in the mapping of local gas and dust, something where over densities could be indicative of a nova remnant or the galactic current sheet wave. But scientists have run into problems, and none is bigger than the dust. It turns out that not only do we have a hard time spotting it, but it frustrates our ability to accurately measure the gaseous component of the sheet. Now here's what we know. In terms of the waves emanating radially from the galactic center, there is a large wave behind us, and one that appears to have begun engulfing our system now which has considerable voids within it, but is a large coherent structure on the macro scale. We recently learned a lot more about the wave behind us, the Radcliffe wave, and while the scientists claim they can't figure out why it so nicely does a sine wave hugging the galactic equator, if you haven't slept through this video so far, I bet you've got some ideas. It's one thing to have verifiable proof that it exists, but it's another to know that we're taking a hit from that galactic current sheet right now. So let's go back to another examination. Let's hit the magnetic turbulence seen by Voyager. Now back when these pressure fronts and shocks were first discovered, they wanted to blame pure interstellar turbulence. If you'll recall, I said that was not going to account for what they see. Here, the team is now saying exactly that. That what's expected from normal interstellar plasma is not going to be able to explain the magnetic turbulence seen by the Voyagers. This is where our previous explanation now comes into play. Now that the original hypothesis from the astronomers is debunked, we have to look at the impact of the galactic current sheet on our solar system, how it's affecting us here in our galactic neighborhood. Second, this one was rather simple, but details a critical way we know the current sheet is there. The magnetic flux tubes and Parker instability are precisely what we see in such electric fields that are shaped into a current sheet. We see it in the lab, we see it in the solar wind and in the sun's current sheet, and we see it at the galactic level as well. Anytime there is a central magnetic object and disk electric field at its equator, it's going to ripple and wave into a current sheet due to the Parker instability, and through it flow the flux tubes. The interstellar pickup ions and the gradually increasing plasma pressure associated with the shock waves encountered by New Horizons, which is out past Pluto heading in the general direction of the galactic center. It was an expected announcement, not only because of the overall paradigm with the galactic current sheet, but because just last week we saw a similar story about energetic neutral atoms, ENAs, and how they were exceeding model predictions, which isn't really fair to the model because it models the interactions without the current sheet. 
Both interstellar pickup ions and ENAs result from interactions between solar wind, solar photoionization, and the material just outside the solar system, which we are encountering. It's not just the magnetic pressure fronts and shocks of the current sheet to our solar system, and it's not just the energetic neutral atoms and interstellar pickup ions, the ENAs and IPUs, but the dust stuck to the galactic current sheet has begun penetrating into the inner solar system, with several papers recently showing that excess dust in the interplanetary space and all the way into the sun. We have seen rapid changes to the Ibex ribbon, the magnetic signature of the galaxy on our sun's magnetic field surrounding the solar system. Such magnificent changes can only be explained by a strongly changing galactic magnetic force. They have begun to do detailed analysis of the galactic current sheet vertical waves nearby to our solar system, discovering several important facts about them, including the fact that they are tens of light years wide, meaning that just one passage of a ripple will last several years, allowing us to see it coming as we are now. The wave perturbations are about a 10% deviation in density, which is actually quite a bit for space. And they have a scale height of about 60 to 170 parsecs, which is about 200 to 550 light years tall. The combination of their identification of the current sheet, their ability to characterize its physical form, and the signs that it is hitting right now means now it's time to go to the concept that this is indeed the trigger for the solar micronova. Happening cyclically every time we take the hit and beginning with why we know there must be such an event from the sun, we're going to run through several articles here on evidence of past nova events causing destruction at Earth. But with them comes a bit of a problem for the physics. There are so many of these, so it must be several nova events, but there are no nearby stars that are good candidates which makes them think it was a supernova. But for a supernova to be that close by, it would have destroyed our atmosphere and killed the planet, which we know didn't happen. If it was further away, a distant star, the nova isotopes wouldn't have made it here. They would have decayed. And the same is true if they had been sticking around from a nova before our solar system formed. Further debunking the distant star idea is the fact that for the first time ever, they modeled magnetic fields with the nova explosions, and uh-oh, they found the dust carrying those isotopes doesn't leave the remnant. Magnetic dusty pinballs banging around inside. So again, it's not some distant star. We are inside the remnant of these events, which cannot be supernova because we are still here. But there are no stars nearby to have made the recurring blasts. Enter Doug Vogt and the solar nova hypothesis. If it is indeed the sun and a recurrent nova, we don't need other supernova which would have destroyed the earth and we are inside the remnant, so we wouldn't need any other nearby stars, which again, we don't see as possible. Doug and I may disagree on the minutia of the solar micronova event, but we agree that it's going to happen in general. And his identification of the isotope findings are the key giveaway that we do have a solar nova event. Moving on, a recent study showed that without nova-like events, the galactic current sheet buoyancy couldn't be sustained. But of course, observations tell us it actually is. The only way this is possible, according to this study, is if nova events, like the solar micronova, are recharging the sheet along the way, injecting that energy as the sheet impacts so that it goes right where it needs to go. Add in the stories from the Bible, Egypt, Zoroastrian texts, and other sources of the black sun and the solar flash, it's kind of icing on the cake. Now, remember those two ways to make a nova, a magnetic kick or material accretion, and realize that the galactic current sheet delivers both at the exact same time. It is an electric field containing the galactic magnetic reversal point, there's the magnetic kick, and its ENAs, IPUs, and the dust are the material that accretes. It's actually the only known way in the universe to deliver both known nova triggers at the same time. We already know that material dumped onto the sun causes eruptions as we see with coronal plasma rain triggering isolated flares. So what happens when that material is dumped across the entire sun with this galactic delivery? To quickly review, the isotopes tell us we need a nova, and the only possible answer is the sun given the magnetic dusty pinballs. The solar micronova not only explains earthly evidence from the past, but it's the only way to make the galactic sheet stay buoyant and make the science match the galactic observations. It's the only way to deliver both nova triggers at the exact same time 
And as we have evidence of that sheet impacting the solar system now, we are beginning to see the changes we'd expect to see on the sun. Not just the extra dust, but extra helium chemistry as its magnetic fields are changing. The coronal magnetic fields, all the science, all the signs, matching the ancient stories as well. Folks, there are no holes left here. This is everything you'd need from a scientific perspective. From the deconstruction of traditional Nova astronomy, to the discovery of what is possible, to the verification of the galactic physics, to the necessity of the solar micronova explaining Earth evidence and galactic observations, to the evidence we're in that galactic current sheet impact now. Below the video. You can find more on how else the solar system is changing. There is magnetic evidence from the sun out to Pluto and beyond. Just click the link to the Earth disaster video found in the description box. You could sign up for our e-magazine, which covers this topic, the updates, the ongoing science, and much more. And subscribe here for daily updates on the sun and Earth and the coming cyclical catastrophe. The sun is going to micronova this century, likely before 2050. Now, last but not least, here is how the solar micronova fits into the bigger picture of the entire Earth disaster cycle. The biggest picture painting the entire scenario that is going to happen again in the coming years. Earth enjoys long, quiet eras commanded by the slow grind of wind, rain, and geology. These periods are punctuated by a recurring catastrophe. We're coming to the end of one of these calm periods, and a disaster is coming. By combining millennia of evidence, centuries of study, and the modern capabilities of technology, we can answer the challenge to explain all the evidence of Earth's disaster cycle, and we have all the tools to track the next one. The Earth is about to do something it hasn't done for thousands of years. The magnetic poles are shifting. The strength of Earth's magnetic field is fading. There are magnetic changes throughout the solar system and on the Sun. We're going to be showing you stories of this cycle of disaster that will visit us again soon. This story is told several ways, and here you're going to hear them all. We'll begin with the pole shift. It's real, and it's going to happen. In fact, it's already happening. There are major magnetic pole shifts every 12,000 years called geomagnetic excursions. There are even more minor events on the 6,000 year half cycles. The China event was just confirmed earlier this year. The most well studied events are the last one 12,000 years ago, the Gothenburg geomagnetic excursion, and an exceptionally powerful one about 40 something thousand years ago called Le Champ. It's the same for other events. You can find information on all of them when you search the science journals. This happens very regularly, and it has already started happening again now. The Earth began its magnetic shift in the 1850s, but it has progressed more since the year 2000 than it had in the 150 years or so before. The shift is accelerating, and will keep accelerating. These events coincide with major climate shifts in the past, volcanic events, and biosphere stress that results in the extinctions of species. After the scientific field went back and forth on this topic for decades, the conclusive study was performed in the world's number one geophysics journal. These magnetic excursions take out several species and cause serious stress on the entire food chain, through not only volcanoes and climate shifts, but extra space radiation, navigational issues with birds, mammals, and marine creatures. These shifts can happen very rapidly. In fact, if the next one happened tomorrow, it already wouldn't be the fastest one in history after having been ongoing now for more than 150 years. When it reaches peak acceleration, it will be shifting 100 times faster than today, or more, and we'll just have months left, maybe weeks. This is a story with a thousand pieces, but they come together to tell a scary future for our planet and it's told in the rock, sediment, the fossils, and the cooled lava. 
Let's next address the fact that this event seems to be hitting the whole solar system. Let's further take a step out to the galactic level very quickly. The galaxy has a rippling electric current sheet, just like stars, our sun, and like energized sphere magnets in a lab. In our galaxy, the wave height, the amplitude, and the wavelength have been analyzed, and based on a speed of around 600 to 800 kilometers per second of outward radial flow, they should be hitting our solar system about every 12,000 years. This current sheet contains the galactic magnetic reversal point, not the galactic equator as incorrectly is believed by many. It is this galactic magnetic reversal, expected about every 12,000 years, that is impacting our solar system, and which is the driving force behind the overall 12,000 year disaster cycle of Earth. Up next, what about those changes in the solar system? Well, Venus's fastest winds are now blowing harder and faster, in fact, about 33% faster. Studies of Earth have indicated that solar activity, which is modulated by Earth's magnetic field, helps drive wind speeds at all altitudes, so a magnetic change at Venus would certainly explain those winds. Mars has seen more climate change than Earth has, increasing seismic activity, and is even now believed to have an active, alive mantle when it was long thought to be dead as a whole planet. We have studies on Earth's magnetic field and solar activity related to both long-term climate on Earth and seismic activity, so a magnetic change at Mars would make sense, and a major magnetic change may actually have woken up Mars mantle, such that the experts were right when they used to think it was dead, and they are right now. Hard to explain all the Mars changes in one stroke, unless it's a planetary magnetic event. Jupiter has had many cloud changes, including to the Great Red Spot, but its most interesting change is in the radio signals coming from its magnetic fields. This is a direct indication that those magnetic fields are changing, which would also explain the cloud anomalies, as on Earth we know that solar and geomagnetic conditions impact the clouds. Saturn's 30-year orbit is eccentric, and every 30 years, at its closest point to the Sun, a superstorm forms in the Northern Hemisphere due to the increased solar energy input to the system. It just came 10 years early, for the first time in the telescope record. Why? Well, a magnetic shift on Saturn would let more energy from the Sun into that system, the same amount that used to take 10 more years to achieve such a storm. Record auroral activity on Uranus, along with record storm activity, is another indication of a changing magnetic condition. The planetary magnetic fields are what block solar wind from the atmosphere, and a magnetic shift on Uranus would allow more solar plasma and higher auroral activity. Neptune just had a storm reversal, and that's a big deal. Neptune storms follow patterns just like Earth hurricanes follow patterns. Now imagine a hurricane formed off the coast of Florida and shot eastward across the Atlantic and hit Africa. That can't happen, right? Well, it just did on Neptune. And the Neptunian storm's electrical dominance suggests that for it to happen, something electromagnetic has reversed. Lastly, Pluto lost 20% of its atmosphere in less than two years, far more than is expected due to freeze-out in Plutonian winter. How does a planet lose its atmosphere so rapidly? Same way Mars did long ago. The magnetic field collapses in a major shift. So that's magnetic shift evidence on all the planets, and yes, we've got it on the Sun as well. There is a noticeable coronal magnetic field shift and a corresponding helium chemistry change. If the galactic magnetic reversal is impacting the entire solar system, we should see those magnetic changes on all the planets and the Sun, and we absolutely do. But the galactic current sheet should also be delivering dust, ions, neutral gases, and impacting the large-scale magnetic fields surrounding the entire solar system. What do you know? Scientists are seeing more interstellar ions than expected. That's one. Scientists are also seeing more energetic neutral hydrogen than expected. That's two. And as is evident in several recent studies, the dust is increasing in the inner solar system. That's three. Scientists are also noticing phenomenal changes in the ibex ribbon, the interstellar magnetic imprint on the outer heliosphere surrounding the solar system. That's four for four on chemistry and large-scale magnetism, plus the magnetic changes across the solar system planets and the sun, a solar system shift. 
that's Earth's history, modern observations, the solar system, and galactic physics, all singing the same song. But wait, if the galactic current sheet is radially moving outward from the galactic center, shouldn't we have seen the closest stars towards the center of the galaxy being impacted? Because of the distance between stars, we can really only look to the closest ones, the Proxima Centauri system and Barnard star. There is also AD Leo, which is a star about the same distance away from the galactic center that we are, but several light years to the north. All three have had outburst activity at super flare levels or higher. Barnard's star first, as it's furthest away in line. Proxima had record flaring activity after that, and then recently, so did AD Leo. And while it would have been nice if we had been using the most modern technologies 60, 80 years ago to see the activity of stars further away, all the ones we have monitored in this way, in the modern era, have done exactly as expected in terms of an uptick if the galactic sheet had impacted them first, and they did so in the correct order, right at the sun, and our solar system is next in line. So far, all the stories complement one another, so let's dive deeper into the star outburst idea. One of the recurring pieces of evidence in these cycles is the nova level isotopes discovered on Earth, those that can only be made in a stellar nova event. And they happen to show up in microtectites and fossils from these 12,000 year disaster cycle events on Earth. But can the galactic current sheet produce a recurring micronova on the Sun? Yes, because there are two ways scientists know how those recurring nova are triggered elsewhere in space. One is a magnetic kick to the star, and the other is to dump material onto the star, an accumulation called accretion. It just so happens that the galactic current sheet, bringing the galactic magnetic reversal, delivers the magnetic kick, and that extra dust, neutrals, and ions coming with the sheet is the material dumped onto the star. Both known methods of making a nova combined into one with the galactic current sheet. After the first ever nova study that actually included magnetic field influence, we know that the isotope stuck to the dust can't make it out of the nova remnant. So, those here at Earth arriving every 12,000 years have to be from our star. The isotopes tell us what we need in terms of what a star must do. The galactic current sheet brings both known methods in one, and they can't be coming from some other star. The coincidences are really piling up now. And as it turns out, events like the solar micronova at various stars finally fixed the long-standing galactic physics problem. They knew the current sheet existed and extended throughout the galaxy, but their models couldn't resolve how it was sustained at that distance. Well, it just so happens, if you inject nova energy directly into the magnetic system of the galaxy at the current sheet, it gives it the juice to persist and sustain. So, the current sheet triggering stellar outbursts actually fixes galactic physics. Last year, after many years of swearing up and down it wasn't possible, that it wasn't a thing, astronomers have finally admitted that micronova exist. These events recurring at the Sun are not only the only explanation for the Earth isotope evidence, they not only can be triggered two ways by the galactic current sheet, but they are also actually needed to explain our real universe observations of the galaxy. Same story, different fields of science. So let's come back to Earth. Every catastrophist throughout history included the Earth tilting, turning over, and creating massive tsunamis as the oceans slosh around. Einstein and several others agreed that it would be the unlocking of the crust from the mantle that would cause the shift, but they couldn't figure out how. How do you unlock the crust? With modern evidence, we now know that the crust is locked with a thermoelectric equilibrium, and scientists already know the sun's impacts induce electric current into the mantle right through that crust mantle boundary. The solar micronova surges enough of that current to disrupt the thermal and electrical aspects of that thermoelectric equilibrium, unlocking the crust. So, the micronova is also needed to finally finish the stories of the catastrophist claims that the Earth tilts, turns, and triggers massive tsunamis. Interestingly, several scientists in Einstein's time also did the math on what would happen if they could unlock the crust. The ice weight at the polar region would want to spin at the equator, the point of greatest centrifugal force, and the greatest bulk of ice 
happens to want to tilt Earth such that Greenland would end up at the equator, and so would the portion of Antarctica that is south of Australia. This would put the Bay of Bengal in the Indian Ocean and Peru at the North and South Poles, which is exactly what was predicted long ago by several other catastrophists who didn't have that ice math from Einstein's time, which is absolutely amazing. But it's not just a two-way coincidence there. The magnetic poles are already moving, as we mentioned, and they are set to meet one another, to collide in the Bay of Bengal, with Peru, of course, being on the opposite side of the planet. If the planet tilts as previously predicted, and as the later math would suggest it will, it will just so happen to put the magnetic poles back at the north and south geographic pole. That's perhaps the greatest coincidence of them all, and yet, just another on our list. The story grows even more interesting when we realize that religious texts and mythological stories say exactly this will happen, from the earth swaying to and fro like a drunkard, to the black sun and days of darkness, which would be caused by the material accumulating on the sun before the micronova, to the great waves and floods and fire and volcanoes and the loss of species. Now, how in the world do those old stories now match the science? Not only the science, but the humanity as well. The culture of us humans today makes the entire world seem like one giant Sodom and Gomorrah, the rise of satanic degeneracy, the loss of traditional moral values. It is exactly as was written. So they predict what modern science predicts, and even down to how humans will behave. Honestly, how many of these coincidences are we supposed to ignore? Well, let's add on another one. It seems the governments and elites are preparing for exactly this. They are acting recklessly because they know there will be no reckoning. They are spending like there's no tomorrow because on a realistic timeline, there isn't one. Governments are digging underground, and elites like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are expanding their options. Bezos is digging out a mountain in the Sierra Diablos right across the street from his Blue Origin launch facility. And Elon Musk has SpaceX and The Boring Company. Celebrities and billionaires are buying doomsday bunkers at a surprising rate. Even Andrew and Tristan Tate are building one in Romania. Folks, most of science is one vector, one line of evidence, and then best estimations or guesses about what it means. This is not most science. It is the same story told by Earth's history, paleoclimatology, paleomagnetism, fossils, sediment, solar system physics, astrophysics, galactic physics, modern observations, math, religion, culture, and the movement of the elites matches up. Don't listen to what they say. Just watch what they do. Speaking of math, current rate of change suggests we have only 10 to 20 years left. So will you acknowledge the mountains of evidence singing the same song? Or will you let the world distract you? Will you let disbelief dissuade you? Your future and your children's future depends on your answer.